Buenas noches para todos y para los participantes que ya se encuentran conectados. Vamos a dar eh, una espera de cinco minutos mientras se conectan más personas y damos inicio a nuestro webinar. So, Dr. King and Dr. Papandrea, we're going to give people a few minutes until they connect, like till 7.05, and then we'll start. Ok, eh, buenas noches para todos y bienvenidos a este webinar acerca de inestabilidad compleja del codo. Es un placer para mí moderar este webinar el día de hoy y antes que nada quiero agradecer a la Sociedad Colombiana de Ortopedia y a la Sociedad Colombiana de Hombro y Codo por el apoyo proporcionado para estas actividades académicas, por supuesto a nuestros conferencistas invitados y también a todos ustedes los participantes que se encuentran conectados por su interés y tiempo. Aprovecho además esta oportunidad para invitarlos al próximo congreso bienal de nuestra Sociedad de Hombre y Codo, que se llevará a cabo en la ciudad de Cartagena del 27 al 29 de octubre. Tenemos unos invitados y un programa de lujo. No se pierdan esta oportunidad de este congreso. Los conferencistas que tenemos invitados esta noche no hablan español, por lo que a partir de este momento 
haremos nuestra transmisión en inglés. Uh, Dr. Papandreou and Dr. King, good night. And first of all, thank you for your time and participation in this webinar. It is a great pleasure for us having you guys tonight as guest speakers for this webinar in a topic that a lot of us are not very familiar with. Let me say a few words about our first speaker, Rick Papandrea. Dr. Papandrea is an experienced upper extremity orthopedic surgeon with training from Harvard and the Mayo Clinic. He has a vast experience in the diagnosis and treatment of elbow conditions, and today he will share some aspects that will help you to come across more confident when diagnosing and treating patients with complex elbow instability. Uh, the title of Dr. Papandrea's presentation is Current Concepts in Complex Elbow Instability Treatment Based on Pattern Recognition. Welcome, Dr. Papandrea, and please go ahead with your presentation. Well, thank you so much for having me this evening, and uh, thank you for your time uh, letting me speak about something I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, you should be seeing my screen right now, yes? Can you see yes. my presentation? Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, well, Graham is going to follow me with a topic that feeds right into what I'm speaking on, and so I'm going to tread lightly on his topic, but touch on it so it fits into the whole pattern and spend a little bit more time speaking of some other fracture patterns. <clears throat> I don't have any disclosures. Uh, this is the last slide, or probably the most important slide in the whole talk. So I'd like to start with this, and I'll come back to it hopefully after explaining things so that it becomes more clear. But what I wanted to go over this evening is utilizing pattern recognition of coronoid fractures to understand the mechanism of injury of the complex fracture dislocation of the elbow, and that should then lead us to a, a hopefully a relatively thought out uh, treatment uh, algorithm. So there's three types of general types of fractures of the coronoid. There's a tip, the anterior medial and the base or basal fracture, and I'll go into this in more detail. Uh, the tip fracture is posterior lateral rotatory instability, which is Graham, Graham is going to speak to us about this. Uh, in, I think he'll probably talk about simple dislocations as well as a complex fracture dislocation, which I'm focused on here with the coronoid fracture. The anterior medial fracture is a more recently recognized fracture, which comes from posterior medial rotatory instability. And then there's the basal fracture, which is in a transelectron fracture dislocation. So we'll come back to this slide. Hopefully it'll make a lot more sense. But if you can leave here and you already know the, the basic fracture patterns, the coronoid, the tip, anterior medial, and basal, then I'd like you to pick up the understanding of the mechanism. And if you already know the mechanism of injuries, then I, then I hope that you can have a, a, a good algorithm started in your head as the treatment for these complex injuries. So getting to understanding elbow instability, Dr. Mori, who both Dr. King and myself trained with, he spoke of or speaks of the primacy of the coronoid, or coronoid is really the king of the elbow, back to Graham, of course, but um, it, 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 without it, the elbow is not stable, and with it, we have stability typically, as well, as long as there's other uh, stabilizing factors. The coronoid, though, the fracture pattern and elbow fracture dislocations will lead us to know what type of injury we had, and therefore, what type of treatment we need. For the elbow to be stable, we really need the lateral collateral ligament. It's pretty hard to have any sort of stability without it. In, in nearly all the fracture patterns, we'll see some injury to the ligament. Sometimes with a transalecranon fracture dislocation, it's in continuity, but usually there's a fracture of a portion of the ulna, even in that injury, that renders this lateral side of the soft tissues unstable. We'll see uh, in a few slides coming up why the lateral side is so important. A lot of times when people speak of elbow instability, they think about the lateral, but then they also think about the medial side. And with the medial side, traditionally, we talk about the anterior band of the medial lateral ligament. But it really doesn't have as much to do with traumatic instability as one might think. Sometimes some surgeons will feel like additional repair of the anterior band of the MCL is important. I find this is typically not that critical. We'll hear from Graham and see what he thinks about it with posterior lateral rotatory instability. But the LCL is much more important than the medial band of, of, or the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament. Now, the posterior band of the medial collateral ligament does have a role uh, in, in, in some instability, and that's a, there's a growing understanding of this. So if we're going to think medial is probably more posterior band rather than anterior band 
but the, but the more important stabilizer for soft tissue is a lateral band. And the radial head is, is of significant importance when there's a deficient coronoid in elbow fracture dislocations. Why, 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 this, why, is it, why is it so? Why is it this way? Well, when we see an x-ray of the elbow, we traditionally, as an orthopedic surgeon, look at it in an AP uh, photograph or uh, image like this, a uh, radiograph, and that's not how we function. We typically function with some abduction of the shoulder. If we put a weight in the arm, that abduction uh, provides a, uh, a distraction force laterally. That's why the LCL is so important and a compression force medially. And that's why the medial side of the coronoid is so important. This repetitive gravitational stress, very stress every day during ADL is really stresses the elbow in a unique way. So in general, just to go over something quickly, surgical exposures of the elbow, I would recommend when we're treating coronoid fractures not to go anterior. There is a report in the literature utilizing this exposure, but I found it very difficult when I've tried this a few times. Some of the tip fractures can be approached laterally if there's a posterior lateral injury through the radial head defect. But for these medial fractures, which I'll touch on, uh, one needs to be comfortable going to treat these through a medial approach. Uh, in Africa, where I just came from this morning, uh, dual incisions are used almost exclusively for acute and delayed trauma. I was taught to go through a posterior incision, but that was by Dr. O'Driscoll, and he switched to mostly medial and lateral incisions now as well. I will sometimes still go posterior, but I've got, I'm moving further and further to dual incisions for uh, treatment. A deep medial exposure is uh, something that a surgeon needs to be comfortable with if the uh, medial coronoid fractures are going to be treated. This can be extensile or more limited, as you'll see. With any elbow fracture dislocation, uh, with any joint dislocation or joint injury, one wants to have a concentric joint when we're finished. The elbow should be rendered stable, and we want to prevent displacement. For the elbow, it's really important that we prevent that varus. And then, of course, we have to prevent a posterior lateral rotatory instability as well, which Graham will go into and discuss, I'm sure, some of the ways that this, to uh, protect from displacement after treatment. So uh, on to the topic, coronoid fracture classification. The first classification that came in the literature was that of Reagan and Morey. And there's a type one, two, and three. And I just want you to see this because it will help you understand some of the confusion that exists as we talk about uh, a, a newer classification, which I think leads us more into treatment uh, discussion and understanding of the injury. So this is something that's, this is out of the Mayo Clinic. This is Dr. Morey. And this is probably why there's even more confusion because as you'll see in a second here, Dr. O'Driscoll from the Mayo Clinic has his classification, and there's some confusion about numbers and, and descriptions. Dr. O'Driscoll went on to classify fractures a little more specifically uh, with tip, anterior medial, and basal. And he has this diagram, which looks rather confusing. And if one goes through it piecemeal, it becomes a little bit easier to understand. But breaking it down most simply, it makes sense if one thinks of a tip fracture, an anterior medial, and then a basal fraction. So for the O'Driscoll classification, we don't use numbers one, two, or three, or Roman numerals one, two, or three. We say tip, anterior medial, and basal. This is where more confusion comes in. David Ring published a paper. He utilized uh, the coronary fracture classification that O'Driscoll utilizes, but then he, he numbered them one, two, and three. So we don't wanna use these numbers. It becomes confusing. when We talked back and forth with each other. And also it doesn't really help us understand what's going on. So tip, medial, basal. With a tip fracture, these are these uh, tip fractures come from a posterior lateral rotatory instability. The anterior medial fractures come from a posterior medial rotatory instability. And the basal fractures are from transelectron fracture dislocations. So let's break these down. Graham's going to go through the posterior lateral rotatory instability mechanism. The important thing to think about in this mechanism, which we'll see more about, is right here. We can imagine the trochlea taking the tip of the electric or the tip of the coronoid off with these injuries. These, these injuries, these tip fractures are part of the terrible triad and they come from this mechanism. So tip fractures, uh, Driscoll breaks them down into a subtype. So there are numbers in the subtypes and this is less important, but a subtype one is a flake, a subtype two is two millimeters or bigger. So think posterior lateral rotatory instability and Dr. Graham. Uh, Dr. Graham King's talk coming up here next when we think about these tip fractures. There's a terrible triad or algorithm, which you'll go into, I'm sure. I did want to add this one slide. I just came from uh, Ethiopia where they don't have access to radial head implants, and I'm not sure what the availability is in South America for you, but I've seen 
uh, in other areas where there's uh, not the availability of metallic implants, for the surgeons to create one out of a longitudinal metallic implant like a screw with polymethyl methacrylate. So there are ways to make your own spacer if needed to uh, reconstruct an injury. So onto the, onto the medial fractures, the, the medial coronoid fractures. And the, the mechanism of these is a posterior medial rotatory instability, varus posterior medial rotatory instability or PMRI. And this is a fracture subluxation of the coronoid with a distraction injury to the LCL. So what we see in a dynamic film might look fairly benign. With a stress film, we see opening here, narrowing here. This is the sign that something's wrong with the coronoid. This is a, typically something that looks maybe rather benign. Even on a CT scan, this looks like it may be even be relatively concentric, although we worry about loading right here in this defect. On the AP view and, and the coronal view, we see this deficiency in the coronoid causing an incongruity, and these typically lead to more rapid post-traumatic arthritis than one would expect. These can look rather subtle, or they can look more significant, which you'll see in a second. This, this is a fall uh, mechanism as well, but instead of a valgus, there's a varus, and instead of a supination, there's a pronation. That torque drives the medial trochlea into the coronoid, causing the fracture of the medial coronoid. There's an LCL disruption, which is obligatory for this injury as well. And this means there's not a radial head fracture. So when we're looking to see fracture patterns, we're looking for a distraction, not a radial head fracture. If we see a radial head fracture, it's most likely not a medial coronoid fracture or at least a typical medial coronoid fracture. These can be rather significant and severe where the medial trochlea drives completely through the coronoid or they can be more subtle, as you saw earlier. Looking for the presentations, again, looking for subtlety, sometimes just some narrowing, looking for an intact radial head, sometimes they're more severe. We're looking for wedge signs, we're looking for any double lucencies, and we're getting a CAT scan to see what's going on at that point in time. When we see these injuries, typically we want to buttress them. We can utilize a manufactured coronoid plate, we can utilize small hand plates, we can make a spring plate out of a one-third or a one-fourth tubular plate to buttress these injuries. Uh, with very severe injuries, we want to support that medial side and also the lateral side for distraction. And we might utilize a hinge for that or even a bridge plate. That's a finger, you're looking at an x-ray. I haven't bridge plated one of these yet, but that's something that one can do if necessary by splitting the triceps. So the injuries may be somewhat subtle on some of the x-rays. We get a CT scan and we can see the articulation is completely uh, uh, deficient in this portion, and that's going to lead to increased stresses and loss of uh, articular congruity and rapid arthrosis if left alone. So these can be approached through a small split, fixing the pieces, buttressing, and fixing the lateral collateral ligament through a separate lateral approach. So the, the, uh, the algorithm for the medial coronoid is a fixed and medial coronoid, or at least support it. We can reconstruct it, reconstruct it if it's more delayed with a graft, we need to fix or support the LCL. And then the role of the posterior band of the MCL is developing. The last fracture pattern for uh, olecranon or for coronoids is a trans olecranon fracture dislocation. This is a Montasia variant where the distal humerus drives through the olecranon. It may fracture the radial head and it fractures the medial coronoid. It's important to look at the coronoid as critical. It's often displaced as a separate piece here, even uh, positioned more medial than one would expect. The radial head may be fractured. It's critical to save the radial head or replace the radial head if necessary, because we need to really support the, uh, the, the area of fracture healing. This area of, of fracture is typically a little bit less likely to heal as there's a bit of a watershed area here. We need a strong buttress plate and possibly even a, uh, a separate plate. Just another shout out to Dr. King. Uh, it, fixing a radial head if we don't have implants that are, are specific, sometimes screw fixation is actually better and plate fixation with cross screw fixation. So don't forget that when we're saving the radial head. So we wanna use a, a posterior plate, maximize fixation and fix the coronoid. We have to grasp that medial uh, fracture fragment of the coronoid and get it back in the anatomic position to have this rendered stable and not go on to uh, some sort of arthrosis. Uh, here, you know, we prevent a problem by making sure we get these fractures fixed. That may mean pulling things apart completely to wire the pieces together, to at least get things back together, to have some construct, even if there's arthrosis, that's back in an anatomic configuration.
So again, you know, the starting uh, where I where I started, I should say, finishing up uh, with the uh, first slide last again. I want everybody to recognize the three types of patterns for uh, cornered fractures: tip, anterior medial, and basal. Realizing that the tip fracture is from posterior lateral rotatory instability. Uh, we'll hear from Graham on the treatment algorithm. The anterior medial fracture is from varus posterior medial rotatory instability. We want to restore that medial uh, coronoid support. We want to fix the LCL. And then if things are tenuous, we want some sort of additional support, possibly a fixator, maybe even a plate. And then we want to think about the posterior band of the MCL. Basal fractures are treated by fixing or replacing that radial head using cross screw fixation if necessary, fixing the olecranon and the coronoid. So when we look at an injury like this, hopefully you can look at this and say four months after injury, we see distraction of the radial head uh, to a capitellum. We know there's an LCL injury. We see compression here. And this somewhat subtle injury that looks maybe not so benign is actually very uh, significant. This patient will go on to very rapid problems if left alone. She was suffering significantly at four months even. So this is a varus posterior medial injury. It's a medial coronoid fracture. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll just stop there. I'm uh, pretty much at, at my uh, end of time. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them if we do have time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Papandre. That was a great presentation. I think we will have some time at the end to discuss and have some questions. Now, let me briefly introduce our next speaker, Graham Kim. Dr. Kim is a world-renowned elbow and wrist orthopedic surgeon. He has published several papers on elbow conditions, and I am sure his name and work is familiar to most of you. Today, he will share his experience and understanding of posterior rotatory instability of the elbow that will help you to better understand and treat patients with this condition. So, Dr. King, welcome. Um, please go ahead. Good evening, and thank you for that kind introduction. I'm going to focus... Uh, on postural lateral rotatory instability. Rick's given you a very uh, outstanding overview of patterns of instability. And I think uh, it really uh, is a very good lead in to what I'm gonna talk about here, which is really a subset of the injuries he's talking about. So postural lateral rotatory instability is a rotatory subluxation of the ulna relative to the trochlea and the radial head is connected to the ulna and goes along for the ride. So the radial head goes posterior lateral relative to the capitellum. And of course, uh, Shauna Jiskel described this. So, uh, well, I guess it's 30 years ago now. Wow. And uh, um, uh, when he described this pattern, and he, he thought that many elbow dislocations had, a, had the cause being this a pattern of postural lateral rotatory instability where the injury starts lateral and progresses medial. Now we know that, of course, some injuries uh, go the other way, but this is probably the most common you know, cause of uh, elbow dislocations. And when we look at the anatomy of the lateral ligament, it's not like looking at the ACL of the knee. You don't see this big structure. And while it's uh, shown in red here, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is not something that you really see. It's a capsular ligament. It's a thickening of the ligament. And you just need to know where it is in order to know how to protect it when you're operating on the elbow and then how to fix it uh, if it's damaged. So this concept is, is really critical. It goes from the a humerus to the crista supernatoris on the ulna passes over the annular ligament, but it's very intricately, intricately uh, uh, connected to the radial collateral ligament and the annular ligament, as well as the posterior lateral capsule. And it doesn't stand out as a single structure, which I sometimes people think get, get confused about. The other thing when you're thinking about fixing it or, or replacing it is it's pretty isometric. So unlike the medial collateral ligament, which is not isometric, uh, it actually has a pretty constant uh, uh, angle uh, uh, length uh, throughout flexion and extension. So if you are repairing the LCL and you get the axis of motion correct, then it's been shown to maintain the stability throughout range of motion. So it, it makes it a little simpler when you're going ahead to fix it or reconstruct it. And what Sean showed in this uh, classic paper uh, in 1990, uh, and I'll just draw your to your attention is is he cut the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, but kept the other structures intact, and he and that's number two here, and he found this pattern of instability 
which when we fixed the LUCL, which is number five, the stability of the elbow was restored. So this is the, the classic work which tells us how to manage posterolateral rotatory instability. Now, if you cut everything, you also end up with uh, varus instability. And we'll talk about a bit of both in the next little while. So I think when you think about acute lateral collateral ligament insufficiency, the most common uh, time you see it, of course, is with an, a simple dislocation of the elbow. That is a dislocation without a fracture. But you also see it associated with or without a dislocation with fractures of the radial head and coronoid, as uh, Dr. Pampandrea just uh, showed you in his, uh, in his talk. It also sometimes gets damaged by us, either by injecting multiple steroid injections for tennis elbow, or when we're approaching the lateral side of the elbow, if we don't uh, uh, respect the location of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, I think it's often iatrogenic. And I could certainly say when I was in my training, I often cut this ligament and didn't really recognize what I was doing. So it's something that you just need to know it's there and then you know how to protect it. So here's a typical kind of a skateboarder injury. So this is a posterolateral dislocation, a small flex fracture, but uh, more or less it's a simple dislocation with a couple of flex. So post-reduction here, uh, there's a heavy plaster splint, which is not ideal, but that's of course often all we have in our emergency departments. And you can see the ulnar humeral joint is gapped open, the radial head is dropped posterolaterally. So this is called the drop sign, and this was described by Ralph Coonrad. Uh, and published in 2005. So how do you manage that after a simple dislocation? It's actually pretty frequent. Uh, and I think it's kind of like a shoulder fracture where the humeral head often sublux relative to the glenoid right after the injury. So what we know about lateral ligament in injuries is that if you pronate the forearm, uh, that is point the thumb to the intact ligament uh, and use active motion, the elbow uh, remain stable. I'm not going to show you all the biomechanics tonight because we don't have time, but remember to point the thumb to the intact ligament and you'll remember which way to put the forearm. The other thing I think Bob Hodgkiss really showed us uh, has made, I think, a major change to rehab, at least our, in our practice. So overhead rehab is standard for us now after elbow dislocations and fracture dislocations. And we've also studied this in our lab. And it turns out you can cut just about anything in the elbow. And if you put the arm overhead and uh, actively move the elbow, even if all the ligaments are cut, it doesn't actually dislocate. So this is a good position to place the arm after uh, the dislocation I just showed you. So this is exactly what we did. Three days later, uh, he was doing isometric exercises, that is activating his biceps, his triceps, overhead rehab, and you can see already the elbow is much better aligned. And he went on to do well, and at six weeks, Congress elbow turned out to be stable at long-term follow-up and an excellent result. So that's a pretty standard management pathway for us for the simple dislocation with a primary lateral injury. Obviously, there was an in medial injury here as well, but the lateral injury was the uh, more important part that caused the instability pattern. Now, sometimes these can be challenging. This is uh, another posterolateral dislocation. This lady is uh, quite large. Um, she slipped in a shopping mall, and uh, you can see she has a very, very displaced uh, elbow dislocation. And after a few attempts uh, in the emergency department, uh, this is what we were presented with. So they actually couldn't get the elbow in. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this was left, and she showed up in our office three weeks later uh, with a perch dislocation uh, and significant discomfort. And so what's the management for this? So we know that, of course, it's a little bit more than postural rotatory instability. It's really a, 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 an elbow dislocation with medial and lateral ligament injuries. Uh, but again, probably the lateral ligament is the most important structure to fix, as uh, uh, Rick just mentioned. So how do you fix the lateral collateral ligament? You can use suture anchors. I'm not a real anchor person, I must say. I, I was taught by Sean this kind of technique where you use transosseous sutures. I love doing it out the front and back, but it's a little technically difficult sometimes to pass those sutures, especially if your approach is, is limited. But the concept of putting locking crack house sutures down in the lateral ulnar collateral ligament all the way to the crista back up in the annular ligament and through the radial collateral ligament. And I typically do it as two layers. Uh, and that's been very reliable for me over the years. So the most important part is getting the 
drill hole correct for the positioning. So that's at the center of an arc of curvature looking at the lateral capitellum. So right at the center. Uh, and uh, again, I do a two level repair. We published this in, uh, in the journal, sorry, Green's Hand Surgery. And uh, again, showing the technique, the drill holes we place, we usually use uh, 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 either uh, wires to pass the sutures, suture retrievers, or you could just use a needle as I often do now. Uh, but again, you do the, the LUCL first, as we're showing here in green. Then you come back and get the annular ligament and the radial collateral ligament as the first layer. Make sure you don't suture it too close because you want to pull that tissue up to the lateral side. And then we do a second layer in the fascia of the ankyneus, closing the coker interval, which is usually how this has been accessed. And then we shuttle those through and tie them over the bone bridge. Now, the key is, of course, if the medial ligaments uh, disrupted, don't pull too hard or you might open up the medial side. This is a very effective technique. And this lady, uh, given that she presented late and you can see she's quite uh, heavy set, as we would say. And uh, I think Rick has a few of these people in the Midwest as well. Uh, I don't know about Columbia for your obesity problem. It's a big problem in, in the America, North America anyway. Uh, and you can see here, we decided to put a bridge plate on her. An X-fix is not a good thing for an obese patient. And uh, we've been quite happy using bridge plates in the uh, obese patients when instability is a concern. So this was taken off at six weeks. We did a poster release at the time, and she got an excellent uh, outcome, as you can see here. Well, I think the other kind of group where I was going to talk about this evening, I think I have time, is to talk a little bit about chronic lateral insufficiency, because this, of course, is something that sometimes sees us and we don't see it. Uh, so these patients present with clicking, snapping, clunking, or locking. They may have a history of a dislocation or a sprain. They may use crutches and walk with their arms or they may have had a prior radial head excision, for example. And there's a number of physical examination tests I thought I'd go through because I think it's quite useful uh, kind of uh, for learning. So of course, testing varus laxity has to be done with the elbow and a little bit of flexion. This lady has a cubitus varus and you can see that the arm can be opened up laterally uh, uh, due to the insufficiency. Uh, the pivot shift test described again, of course, by Sean O'Driscoll uh, is uh, usually positive only in, uh, in a patient that's asleep. It's very important to get the um, uh, correct amount of compression, axial compression, valgus moment, and supination. And you have to do this a few times, even when the patient's asleep, in order to get this right. Uh, I think most people apply... Uh, uh, don't think about applying the valgus and they don't apply enough supination when they're doing this particular maneuver. So this is a lady that we are able to do at a wake. We only did it twice, once the first time and once for the video. So you can see the dimple when she's dislocated and then she reduces. We'll just show it one more time. So again, a lot of supination, valgus, and now she's dislocated. And then when you keep flexing her, she reduces. So it's kind of like a pivot shift. Uh, the posterolateral lateral rotatory drawer test, uh, Sean's a big fan of this. I don't tend to find it as useful as uh, the hypersupination test, which is my favorite. So uh, again, in this lady with lateral insufficiency, you can see by just by hypersupinating the forearm, she's very comfortable, allows you to do this in clinic. And I would say this is my number one best test to, to diagnose lateral ligament, posterolateral lateral rotatory instability in the clinic. The chair sign, don't tend to use that too much. Uh, you don't want someone dislocating their elbow in the clinic, nor the push-up test. Our floors are too dirty in Canada in the public health system, but uh, uh, you can use these tests, but I don't routinely use them. So let's get on to imaging. Sometimes you can see, of course, a drop sign after a surgical procedure. Here was a, a capitellar a coronal shear fracture. Again, the lateral ligament was loose. So you can use plain radiographs, stress radiographs, MRI, fluoroscopy, as I'll show you. Now, if someone says they can dislocate their elbow and they're coming into clinic, say, yeah, I can dislocate my elbow, doc. Well, that's never a good sign, kind of like someone who dislocates their shoulder for you in clinic. But if they can do it, get them to do it and get an x-ray of it with it out. So that's what we did here in this patient that has postal lateral rotatory instability. Or you can do it uh, applying stress. Obviously, usually that's in the OR. You can do an MRI here showing complete disruption of the lateral ligament. Uh, I think, uh, of course, the fluoroscopy of a pivot shift test, uh, as you can see here, similar to the one I showed you, can be useful. Again, it's hard to kind of get this in your, in your 
floral suite without being in the operating room. So usually this is something you'll do in the OR. As you extend, you'll see that dimple formed in that young lady. And as you flex the elbow, then it reduces. So this is a pivot shift test fluoroscopically. Hypersupination test. Whoop, I think I went too fast for that. Let me go back one if I can. So you can see here with that hypersupination test, I was doing that lady by just by hypersupinating. See how the radial head drops posteriorly and the ulnar humeral joint opens. So that's a hypersupination test. Again, it's often easier to do it in the OR than a pivot shift test, at least for the fleural part. I find it's hard to do the fleural, uh, moving the arm around in the machine. At least they, we use a mini C arm. Now, if you're scoping the elbow and you see this much gapping between the capitellum and radial head, that's never a good sign. This patient has loose body back there as well. You can see the sylvaris laxity. You can diagnose that arthroscopically. You can also do a hypersupination test uh, uh, arthroscopically and see as you hypersupinate, the radial head starts sliding out behind the capitellum. And you can see the chondromalacia where this radial head has been sliding out uh, due to the postural lateral rotatory insufficiency. Uh, you can also, when you're looking in the back, do the supination test and you'll see the lateral side of the elbow opening in someone with postural lateral rotatory instability. So that's the tip of the olecranon, that's the trochlea below, and we're applying a supination moment on the forearm. So how do you treat this? Uh, well, obviously, if you're, you're trying to prevent it is important. So uh, avoiding cutting the ligament when you're doing surgery. I don't think therapy is particularly helpful unless it's an acute post-op condition where the ligament has a chance to heal. Chronic instability, uh, again, people like Erlos Danlos, if they only dislocate at night, you can use a brace with their form and pronation. And or if they have a malalignment, you may want to treat that. But of course, the cornerstone of management for chronic lateral ligament insufficiency is to reconstruct the lateral and collateral ligament. Uh, you can use different tendons, allograft or autograft. I'm a hand surgeon, so I still typically use an allograft palmaris, but you can use things out of a box if you have the, uh, a system which has the money for that, which the Canadian system doesn't, so we didn't not to use allografts. So here's a man uh, with postural lateral rotatory instability. He's got lateral elbow pain. He's clinically got postural lateral rotatory instability. You can see where he's previously evulsed his lateral ligament. Uh, this is the classic uh, description by uh, Driscoll and Moray talking about making the drill hole a little bit uh, uh, more proximal and and uh, and uh, anterior. Uh, so you get the back part of the drill hole uh, where the isometric point is. I don't tend to use the uh, uh, suture through the two drill hole method, uh, but some people like that. I think what's kind of, I would say has disappeared when people talk about lateral ligament reconstruction. I don't know what Rick thinks about this, but I think the capsular plication on the lateral side is quite important. Often people just talk about laying the graft in, but sometimes, especially in younger uh, people, uh, that the soft tissues aren't all that bad and doing a capsule plication first and then putting the ligament on top is, is still something I prefer to do. And this was actually originally described by Osborne and Cotterill uh, for the treatment of instability laterally. Uh, nowadays, we typically will do a docking reconstruction. So I use uh, two drill holes, one at the crista, one at the proximal aspect of the annular ligament. Uh, bring it up and uh, we dock it into the lateral epicondyle and tie it over a bone bridge rather than using a, a loop suture. And this works quite well. And these are the drill holes that you'll see uh, uh, post-op. I think for rehab, if they're a loose kind of patient, you may want to slow them down a little bit, uh, at least a couple of weeks uh, resting 90 degree splint in pronation. And then we splint them in pronation for six weeks uh, and gradually allow them to extend I'll get them to keep wearing a splint at night for another six weeks for a total of 12 weeks for reconstruction. And then we use a lot of overhead rehab protocol and again, avoid varus arm positioning. Rick showed you that's a position people all put their arm and one of the most important parts of the therapist is teaching them not to allow that varus moment on the elbow after surgery. Uh, in this uh, uh, outcome paper by uh, Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo, uh, they had uh, 45 repairs. And you can see the results are not the same as throwing athletes. They're good. Uh, 
uh, they're not great. Uh, so there are patients in this group that have other problems that don't do well, uh, but they found the best results were with graft, graft augmentation in post-traumatic conditions as opposed to people like with Erlos-Danlos syndrome and people with hypermobility. You're just like a shoulder problem. You're not going to do as well. Now, I, you know, these can be more complex. This is a man that dislocated after reduction. He had persistent uh, instability. So someone went in and, uh, and actually repaired his medial collateral ligament. So they didn't read the book. They didn't listen to Rick's lecture. So the wrong thing in this situation is to make a medial incision and put a suture anchor in the medial side. So you can see his elbows still out at two weeks. And of course, by the time he gets to us, we uh, have to do a lateral ligament reconstruction. And I think this is personally for me, I don't use a lot of dynamic external fixators, but when I'm doing ligament reconstructions and I have an elbow that's been out for a long time, I think it's a good indication for a dynamic X fix. This happens to be the DJD2, uh, which is simple and easy to use, which I think works well for lateral elbow surgery. So this is what it looks like post-op. And here he is uh, with a stable elbow after fixator removal. Now, the other final thing to talk about is really lateral insufficiency with uh, deformity. So this is a young man who's got a cubitus varus after supracondylar fracture. I suspect you do see some of that in Columbia. Uh, it was an open fracture. If you look carefully on the uh, picture, you can see that he actually has an open wound there that was uh, a problem when he was young. And here he is at uh, surgery. You can see uh, on varus stress testing, he's got varus instability. And when we uh, do the hypersupination test, he clearly rotates out. So he's got uh, the disease, so to speak. And here's his pivot shift test. Again, he's asleep now. You can get the dimple and get him to pop in. But this one took, uh, my fellow and resident, neither could get this to pivot shift test, but they didn't apply enough supination torque. So make sure you supinate a lot. Now, in this paper uh, uh, from Mike McKee and uh, Emil Shemis group, they showed that the more cubitus varus deformity, the more strain in the lateral ligament. And that's why over time, people with cubitus varus get lateral ligament insufficiency. So in this case, uh, you're going to need to do a reconstruction. Uh, this is an osteotomy that uh, we showed at the Mayo course a number of years ago by uh, a name that I can't say. Uh, but uh, certainly it's, uh, uh, you, if you can say it three times in a row, you're better than me. Maybe you can say it in Spanish, but uh, it's, it's a nice osteotomy, to, but you have to plan it out. And I always put the pictures up in the OR when I do it, but when it all works, it, it works really well and it kind of locks in. Um, and you can see here the steps doing the cuts, you get the notch and this is a very stable osteotomy. Uh, of course, in this case, we also uh, dealt with his nerve. Uh, and then we did a lateral ligament reconstruction. You can see I too use Keith needles to pass the grafts. And then we uh, uh, plated the osteotomy as well. And then the other thing to think about in these patients is, is they tend to have a problem with their triceps alignment. Again, work classic work from Shauna Driscoll. Uh, and it shows here, it's a little hard to see, but you can see his triceps is over the medial, it's sitting over the medial epicondyl. So what we did with, with the medial head of the triceps, we actually detached it and transferred over, as you can see on the far right, to get the triceps to properly pull on the elbow and stop stretching out the lateral ligament. So always think about the triceps when you're doing these uh, you know, operations. It's, it's a lot of surgery, right? An osteotomy, a ligament reconstruction, a nerve, a couple of plates, and now you got to do the triceps. But uh, if you do it all right, which uh, we got lucky here, you can see uh, his alignment was restored. He was very happy with his clinical result and his elbow was stable. So I think when you're thinking about lateral ligament insufficiency and postural lateral rotatory instability, think about that lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Know where it is. Know how to protect it. You need to think about this diagnosis when people come in with vague lateral elbow pain that isn't tennis elbow. Uh, they may have clicking or popping. The pivot shift, chest, pivot shift test is diagnostic, but often not found in the clinic. Consider the alignment of the uh, humerus if you're going to do a reconstruction. And, and uh, I think in general, lateral ligament reconstructions have been, in my hands, pretty successful. And, and it's actually, unlike the medial collateral ligament, which I don't actually do that many of, uh, this is a much more common reconstruction in our country since we don't have any that many baseball players. So unlike maybe Rick's country. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. King. It was a great and insightful presentation. Uh, I think we have some time to discuss a case that we prepared. And also, I want to encourage the participants to make some questions uh, throughout along the way the case so we can discuss. Um, there is a question here while I put my presentation is uh, a question for Dr. King. What are your indications for arthroscopic LCL reconstruction if there is one for you, like arthroscopic LUCL reconstruction? Well, I I, I, I don't think people are doing a reconstruction yet arthroscopically. Maybe people are uh, that haven't told me, but certainly people are doing lateral ligament plications and lateral ligament or repairs arthroscopically. Uh, I think uh, the, probably the best indication for that, for example, would be if you were doing a coronoid arthroscopically uh, and you're going to add a lateral ligament uh, repair. Again, those are, those are very high level arthroscopic technical skill. And I, I must admit that's probably beyond my personal capability right now. I have I have done it a few times, but I haven't been as impressed that I can really tighten up a loose elbow as well arthroscopically because you're really not putting, you know, you're just putting capsular sutures in and, and pulling it up. You're not really putting the kind of sutures that I use in an open procedure. So I'll tend to make a short lateral incision uh, or a posterior incision and uh, do a more definitive repair. So for me, I guess the short answer is I don't do it much. Okay, thank you. Greg, do you have a different opinion on that? Uh, no, um, I, I agree with pretty much what, what Graham just said. I, I've been in a lab and watched some of the people who are doing the plications do them uh, arthroscopically and demonstrate them. And for a chronic injury, it doesn't make much sense to me that some sutures that kind of per string the soft tissues are going to give any sort of a long-term benefit. Although there are people who I trust who are doing it. And, and so I don't know if they're treating a more subtle instability that I'm not recognizing. But if I have somebody who's grossly unstable in a chronic situation, like Graham showed in his presentation, for me, that's an open reconstruction. In my hands, I can't do it arthroscopically. I have done some coronoids arthroscopically. And uh, for a medial coronary, even if the piece is big, uh, it's a great way to get access. But even and in those situations, I'll make a small lateral incision, the ligaments right there, I'll put a drill hole, and I'll tie it over bone as Graham showed. For me, that's just a much stronger approach than trying to, to weave something in, put, spending the money on an anchor. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's more secure uh, and uh, easier to do it open. The, the, the medial coronoid, the coronoid, uh, it can be difficult to get to open. So in my hands, that might actually be a better approach to go arthroscopic. But, but for the lateral ligament, I'm still open. I haven't found an indication for arthroscopic. Great. Thank you. So let's go ahead with the case. This is a really long and complex case. I am not sure that we are going to be able to go through the whole case, but at least let, let's discuss until we can. Uh, so I surveyed my colleagues that do elbow here in Colombia to find a really complex case for you guys. And this is the winner. The, this guy is Dr. Porigua. He's in our hospital in Colombia. And this guy is the guy that gets the craziest case, cases. Uh, and this is the, the guy that presents the cases in our WhatsApp uh, group that we are like, wow, all the time. So... I warn you, this is a complex case. Uh, he, I am presenting the case on his behalf. Uh, he was honest that probably he didn't understand the case well because it was very complex. So let's go ahead. This is a male, 39 years old. His occupation, he's a bodyguard. This patient had a motorcycle accident in February 2020, fell onto a stretched left hand, uh, pain deformity in the left elbow, uh, the neurovascular status was normal and the patient uh, referred no previous history of elbow trauma or pain or anything going on in that elbow before. And the patient presented to the ER. Uh, these are the x-rays, the initial x-rays. And it, it's a pretty uncommon pattern of elbow dislocation. So I would like to uh, uh, hear your opinion. What do you think about these, these x-rays, Rick? Well, the x-rays show, as you mentioned, a complete elbow dislocation. We can't, there's not a good lateral because both the, 
uh, the proximal and distal half of the elbow are really out of plane. But I think what's important here, it's similar to the elbow that, sh that Graham showed, the, the whole humerus is displaced quite far away from the, from the ulna. So if we could see the whole elbow and peel the layers off, we would imagine the distal humerus is probably stripped, not just of the ligaments, but of the soft tissue attachment of the epicondyles. These are really grossly unstable uh, uh, injuries. The, some people term it a naked humerus. The humerus is stripped of everything. And uh, I just had a friend show me an x-ray like this and he was gonna try it closed. And I said, just open it up and fix everything. Uh, at least laterally, and probably the medial soft tissue uh, epicondylar attachments, medial flexor pronator mass, you probably don't need to fix the anterior band of the MCL. If you fix the lateral soft tissues, uh, lateral uh, muscle attachments and the medial muscle attachments, he didn't and it redislocated and he had an x that looked kind of like this. So I, I think when I see this, I think this is going to the operating room for open reduction and soft tissue fixation. Very, very interesting. What about uh, you, Dr. King? Do you think the same? This is the type of x-ray that makes you think this patient needs to be taken to the OR directly and repaired? Well, you know, of course, it depends on your system, whether when that's going to the OR. It needs a reduction for sure. You need to check the neurovascular status. That goes without saying. But this is a medial dislocation, and these are bad actors, as, as Rick said. So in our system, that would people still would give it a go with a closed reduction, but uh, I agree that it's likely not going to be stable and I would have a very low threshold to go to the OR and do something more definitive, as Rick said. But I, I wouldn't necessarily do that the night of in our system. They get a close reduction and we get to it in the next uh, week. Yeah, well, you are pretty much right. This patient went to the OR, the, the, the ER, and the residents, the orthopedic residents from that hospital received the patient and they... Uh, did this, these are the humerus x-rays and these are the wrist x-rays. They take, they took this as part of their protocol. And in the wrist, we can see a little bit of a uh, positive ulnar variance, but I would say that nothing more beyond that. And the residents uh, tried to do a closed reduction in the ER. And of course, this was a failed attempt. Apparently, they only try a couple of times and they decided to take this patient to the OR immediately that night. And they underwent a closed reduction. It wasn't an open reduction, a closed reduction under general anesthesia. And that reduction was successful in terms of getting the elbow back in but uh, probably this elbow was not totally congruent and these are the post-reduction x-rays. Uh, do you see something different, any different opinion from you with these post-reduction x-rays? Uh, you know, we can see in the x-rays that there's quite a bit of displacement between the capitome and the radial head. <clears throat> so we know the LCL is disrupted, of course, from the original injury, but we also know there's quite a bit of uh, a persistent uh, sag or instability. I mean, the medial side doesn't look too bad. I, you know, I, it's certainly the right thing to do to try to get it reduced if we can right away, as Graham said. If I see a patient with those initial x-rays and I'm on call, I'll take them to the OR. And, and if I go to the OR, I'm just going to operate on it and open it. I, I think for a surgeon who's not comfortable doing that to get a reduction like this. This is better than the patient came in with. So this is fine, but I, this is not an x-ray that I would walk away with and say, this is good for now, see me in three weeks. If I had a good lateral and it looked like this, this was more of a drop sign, I think it's okay to watch this very closely and try to treat it closed, but I would expect it's going to fail and it has to be monitored at least weekly to check to make sure it's not out because this is the x-ray where if we think this is good enough, and when the patient comes back in three weeks, we're going to be out at three weeks, maybe even with a little bit of HL if it's later than three weeks. So we don't want to go down that path. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think at this point, uh, there are very good learning points about this case. This medial dislocation pattern is a pattern that is totally different than the typical dislocations that we see. And probably the, the idea of fixing this right away was the right way to do it. But uh, uh, they put the elbow back in. They were kind of 
satisfied with the result despite the, there was some subluxation and they decided to uh, leave the elbow like this and refer the patient to an outpatient clinic with the upper extremity specialist. And this is the, uh, actually, given the subluxation uh, of the, and the opening of the lateral side of the elbow, they underwent a CT scan that night. This is, I can show you really quick, the CT scan cuts. And in this CT scan, what was surprising was the presence of osteophytes in the elbow and this patient told uh, told them that he didn't have any symptom of or any injury before and we see pretty much the same displacement on the lateral side of the elbow i would say uh it's not infrequent to have bodybuilders and people that work as bodyguards with osteoarthritis mm -hmm. at this age, sadly, because I'm not sure in Colombia, but we have a lot of people that spend a lot of time in the gym here. Some of them take steroids. And so we do see osteoarthritis at a young age. Uh, so I wonder whether he lifts a lot of weights and if he's pretty uh, big dude. Uh, he's not pretty big, but he, uh, I have some clinical pictures of him. I'm, I will show them a little bit. But he is not that big, but I am sure that he does some of that activities. So this was the CT scan at the moment of the reduction. And the patient uh, was uh, sent to the clinic, uh, posterior spleen immobilization, upper limb clinic follow-up. But in Colombia, we have sometimes this situation in which the patients get lost in the process with the insurance and everything else. And the patients show up one month after this event to the clinic. So a delayed appointment in this case due to administrative issues. Uh, he presented without new images. The spleen was removed at the clinic. The elbow seemed stable, but it was quite difficult to assess because there was some stiffness at that point. And so he was uh, recommended to start PT and new images were ordered and the patient uh, did not tolerate the PT due to severe pain. The patient got lost again for the follow-up appointment and he came back later than expected again three months after the event with these x-rays. So these are the x-rays uh, three months after the initial dislocation. And it's pretty interesting uh, that <coughs> articulation between the ulna and the trochlea. What, do you have any opinion on that? I, I, I see that the lateral side is still open. There is subluxation of the radial head, but there is a change in the position of the all now and and we were we we quite didn't understand why was that do you have an opinion on that yeah i mean it's hard on these films to know exactly what's going on i don't think this is just a pure uh varus sort of thing that radial head is half to if we look at the 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 best ap if you will the radial head is overlapping the trochlea, so it has to be in front or behind it somehow. It looks like on the other view, it's probably in front of it. So it's almost like the there's a hyper um, pronation, I would think. Uh, but yet the medial side looks like there's some congruency at the medial most uh, ulnar humeral articulation. And this patient needs, a, in my opinion, a, a CT scan. I would do 3D imaging off the CT to understand the relationship between the two, but I think the ulnar humeral joint's not right either, uh, since the radius and the ulnar relationship looks normal. Yeah, I agree with Rick. Rick uh, you know, the elbow is not congruent. Uh, you wonder, his almost looks like his trochlea is a little hypoplastic as well. It doesn't have a very deep groove. Uh, and I was noticing that in the prior films as well. I don't know if that's just something I'm thinking, but at any rate, you know, I think he's definitely... Uh, not congruous, he's slid over medially. You almost wonder on the one view whether there's a little bit of diastasis between his ulna and radius here now as well. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I, for, I just couldn't really move anywhere in treatment of this guy until I had a CT scan. That's how dependent we are here, I guess, in, in assessing this. We got a CT scan. They got a CT scan. So they also got these forearm uh, x-rays in which there is some apparent subluxation of the radial head and the radio proximal radio ulnar joint. And the crest x-rays show an increase in the ulnar variance that we had at the beginning in the grace x-rays that I showed you before. So it seemed at this point that the patient not only had a problem related with the elbow, but also probably a combination, an uncommon combination of a longitudinal instability of the forearm. So, and this is the CT scan of the elbow at that moment. Uh, I'm gonna show you here. This one is not very helpful, that that sequence. Let's see this one, excuse me, next one. So that is the sagittal view. So it seems that the, midi the ulna is articulated with the medial trochlea. I also agree that the trochlea doesn't look quite normal. And actually, when I discussed the case, I think there was some virus in the distal humerus, and there is incongruency in the radiocapitellar joint at that point. Yeah, I guess the question is, did he have a kind of a divergent type dislocation initially, right? That uh, we didn't really see. I, might, I mean, it looked basically medial, but uh, obviously he must have had an interosseous ligament injury in addition. Um, well, the radial head the, 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 in the sigmoid nonsense looks to be reduced on that last view. <clears throat> yeah, in this one, it looks reduced. Uh, so this is a case that I would load the uh, axial or the, whatever CT uh, scan has the most slices in it, which is typically the axial. I would load that into a DICOM reader. I use, uh, um, I use Horos, which is for Max, but um, Radiance is used for PCs. You can load that into a DICOM reader and you can do your own 3D reconstructions and you can manipulate them. I would want to see the CT scan in 3D and be able to manipulate it myself so I can understand as much as possible about the radio owner relationships, the owner human relationships, and the and the and the radio capitella relationships. It seems to me that the the radius and the ulna are still congruent with each other. And then the the uh, radial head is just spun off in a rotatory map fashion. And the ulna is going with it, but uh, I'd like to see that in 3D if possible. Yeah, we didn't have they they didn't have a 3D CT mm -hmm. scan at the moment, and yeah. this was the clinical situation of the patient at that sure. point, three months after the dislocation, and with those images that I show you. The nice thing about these free DICOM readers, he moves pretty well, better than I expected. The nice thing about these free DICOM readers is you can, as long as you can get the DICOMs off the CT scan, either from a CD or a thumb drive, then uh, you can go and load them and manipulate them post, you know, after the fact and manipulate them in a 3D images. So even if the, the system doesn't have the software to make a 3D image or the radiologist chose not to do it, or they gave you only a static image that doesn't help, as long as you can get that raw DICAM data, you can do it yourself. Uh, and the software is pretty user-friendly and it's free. Great, great. That, that's a really good uh, tip, uh, Greg. So what, what, what do you think, what would you offer to this patient at this point in this situation with this elbow 
Uh, he had a decent motion inflection and extension, but he was almost black in pronation and supination. Does, does he have pain at this point? Yes, yes, okay. he had pain at this point. Yeah, because, you know, his motion's pretty good. You could do a lot to him that would make him stiffer. <laughs> um, you know, I think that... Uh, I, I really would have a hard time giving you a surgical plan without doing a 3D CT and understanding this because uh, uh, there's no question that at least on the based on the wrist film, assuming that's a wrist centered X-ray and his other X wrist, I would X-ray his other wrist, of course, to make sure that's a consistent finding. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, assuming he's that ulnar uh, positive, that would suggest that you know the radius must have migrated. But when you look at the proximal end, it doesn't look like that is necessarily the case. So it's hard to reconcile those things. So if that's the case, then there must have be some kind of tilt phenomenon going along on in the forearm as opposed to a, a true, um, just a, a, a radial shortening. So yeah, without more information, I really couldn't <laughs> provide yeah. that plan to no. with you, but you know, obviously if his elbows out, uh, and he's painful or partly out on the CT scan, then you need to, and he's symptomatic enough, you know, I guess you can try to put it in and do a ligament reconstruction. But again, what that would entail would be really unclear to me without further information. But probably, as Rick says, there must be an element of postlateral rotatory instability, lateral ligament insufficiency. So he's going to at least getting something done on the lateral side, but the medial side you know, what's going on there. It may not even want to pull over after this period of time. You might even need to release it a bit medially. And, and of course, he may have a supracondylar uh, varus deformity as well. But again, probably not something I would be taking on at the same time uh, here because I would say it's mild if it's present. So that's kind of what I'd be thinking. And, and I wouldn't be mm -hmm. doing an IOM reconstruction or anything like that. I'd just try to get it in better and, and hold it there. And this is the kind of case that, you know, I would definitely be thinking of a bridge plate uh, if he had a sufficient soft tissues, because you, this is not going to stay in. It's been out for months. And, uh, you know, I would prefer if he had enough soft tissues, use a bridge plate, bridge plate versus a uh, X fix. We don't, and I don't think uh, the internal joint stabilizer, which it's not available in Canada. I doubt you have it in Colombia would be a good choice here anyway, because I don't think it's strong enough to deal with this kind of uh, instability. Rick, what are you thinking? Well, similar. I, I'd want to know, first, the, 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 the previous wrist films you showed and the most recent ones, the, the angle is a little different. The, the dorsal lip of the radius, is you can see that the, the, the image was taken at a, at a some obliquity that's not equal. So I, I'm not convinced that there's a difference. I would want to know if, one, there's wrist pain, uh, I would, the last CT you showed, showed that radial head is actually behind the capitellum. We should, he's not that big of a guy. We should be able to feel it. What happens when we push on it? Uh, you know, does it, does it want to reduce? Does it move? Does the ulna move with it? Does is the whole thing rigid? So I'd want to know some of those things, but I, I would definitely, I, ideally what I'd have is a CT scan of both of his forearms to elbow. And I would compare them and see what they look like. Uh, in 3D uh, to know what's try or try to best understand what's going on. I have a hard time reconciling that there's a uh, a, a, a radial ulnar injury that uh, needs reconstruction. I think it's I think it is elbow, but uh, I too need more information. I mean, looking yeah. at his motion, if he didn't have pain, you can leave some people alone. But he's a bit young, and I would be afraid to do that uh, as well. I totally agree with what Graham said about the chronicity of this. And, and trying to uh, restore stability is one thing, but maintaining a reduced position in these chronically displaced elbows, unless there's huge soft tissue releases, it's very hard to do. And I think we need something very strong. And I, 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 do, I do use the IGS sometimes, but this is not a case. I, I don't think that I would be using the IGS unless I understood it better. Um, I, I haven't bridge plated somebody yet, but I will do it in a heartbeat if I have to. I've done X fixes. Uh, but but the bridge plate would not be a bad idea at all. But I, I just need to understand this a little bit better with some more, you know, with the CT scans, either that we have being manipulated or maybe even a full forearm CT. Yeah, absolutely. I understand you guys that we don't have this enough information for deciding. 
uh, just uh, for discussion, uh, in your experience, have you ever had a case uh, with elbow instability dislocation and at the same time, longitudinal instability like a exoloprestive variant of the forearm? And in that case, if you had that experience, how would you approach that? Would you approach the, the longitudinal instability first, the elbow second, or how, how would you do that? Uh, I, I've not I've not seen it myself, or if I have, I haven't recognized it. I think that if I saw somebody, I was sure that they had both. Uh, I would. Pro it depends on what, you know the severity of each. I wouldn't try to take it all on at once. I know that. I might even um, I might even treat the longitudinal instability with some sort of an immobilization, like even uh, cross pinning, uh, just proximal to the DRUJ with stout 062K wires coming out both sides so they can be retrieved if they break and then treating the elbow and coming back for the uh, IOM reconstruction uh, uh, later. Uh, but again, it depends on the chronicity think, or acuteness of the injury and kind of the severity of each side as well. Yeah, for me, I, I haven't seen a, a true dislocation. I've seen a lateral instability problem with an Essex Lopresti. And I've got that going on right now, actually. So it was a missed, the radial head was out posterolaterally. laterally. So we uh, put that back in, we put a radial head replacement in, we did a lateral ligament reconstruction and we put them in a bridge plate to hold that all together. Uh, and he's still ulnar positive. So uh, our next phase, we just took out his bridge plate recently, and their next phase is to do an ulnar shortening without an IOM reconstruction. He's an older guy. He's actually very happy so far, actually, with his elbow uh, pain is resolved, uh, and he's tracking quite well. Uh, but, of course, he doesn't rotate well, which, in my experience, we published recently on that. You know, the Essex Loprestes don't rotate well no matter what you do. Uh, but if he's got residual wrist pain, then we're going to go ahead and do a, a secondary procedure. But I, I haven't been doing a lot of IOM reconstructions yet. I remain a little unconvinced. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm going a little quick, fast, because we are running out of time. Day, um, uh, let me go ahead. These were their work diagnosis at the moment. They considered the patient probably had a PLRI uh, problem, like a problem in the lateral side, but they considered at the moment that there was a problem, an issue going on with, with the longitudinal instability of the forearm, like a chronic eslopresti variant and, and some elbow osteoarthritis. And in the way they look at the case at the moment, they thought that the main issue was the longitudinal instability uh, so they decided to stage the case and treat this as a chronic esoloprestie injury and then uh, manage that and then address the PLRI. And this was what they did. It's a very, very uncommon technique. I had not seen this before. They did it, and this is uh, published by Michael Hasman, which is using a external fixator, like a really complex external fixator, to reduce the, the forearm and then doing like a, a, a bone tendon bone reconstruction of the IOM and then like a, doing the reconstruction of the LUCL and this is what they did. So this is the really complex external fixator. They put it on the patient for 15 days and this reduced the distal radius and the positive ulnar variance really quick. You can see in the x-ray on the left that actually the patient was negative at the right after 15 days. And then at that point, they decided to do the reconstruction of the IOM with this technique. And then they left the external fixator for six weeks this is when they remove the extra fixator. You can see the bone of the allograft from the IOM reconstruction. And at that moment, uh, this is how the elbow look. So we still have a really bad 
this location, I, I, I think this is the first time that I see that humerus like really AP. And we can see how the ulna is like articulating with the medial trochlea, actually with the epicondyle. I don't know if that is the case, but at least this is the aspect that we see in the x-ray. And at that point, uh, the patient underwent the reconstruction of the uh, LUCL, but of course we see this fail and the patient, the elbow was still totally dislocated or at least out of place. And the patient had persistent medial instability and the elbow was out of place. So what do you think at this point? I am not sure if the destruction with the fixator could be all now in that position. I am not sure. It's hard to know what happened. Uh, you know, the, the, we don't have a great AP of the ulna here. We have one of the radius at last view, but I'm really starting to worry about the medial aspect of the ulna. Uh, here, on, on the x-rays you have up now in the lower right-hand corner, it looks like the medial ulna, the, the coronoid, the anterior medial coronoid is intact. But that last sh shot you showed doesn't look very good. We do see uh, up on the, the, the slide on the right to the graft, the distal aspect of the graft is pulled off the screw at one point. So I don't know if that's healed mm -hmm. or not. And then, you know, we wonder, you know, how, how do you know when to stop? This patient's been fixed kind of in an owner minus position. Um, uh, it's hard to know if that's, you know, where we need to be. If you look proximally bottom right corner, it looks like the PRUJ, the, the radial head is distal to the ulna. So we've lost mm -hmm. some, you know, potential congruency there. So I, I don't know. I don't know if the, that this was a step to take first. This is such a complex situation. Like I said, like we both said, it'd be nice to to get some imaging. I, I you know you can see in the little disclaimer here that this they they use Radiant for these for these uh, viewers. That same software program will do those three D reconstructions on your CT scan. So um, that's that's really a, a a way a way to get some better imaging. Yeah, great, uh, Doctor King. Do you think it's a uh solution for this elbow at this point uh, does any ligament reconstruction will help well I, i'll just make a comment I, I have some experience with using elizarofs and similar devices uh, in the past and whenever you're trying to correct a deformity like this there's going to be you know you're pushing the radius uh down essentially but that means the ulna is being pushed up toward the elbow so it's very common mm -hmm. to see even joints that are not badly located get worse, right? And it's always something to consider. Yeah. So you have to not only follow the, what you're doing at the risk, but check the other end if you're ever doing any kind of a lengthening procedure. So I think this was probably probably made worse, so you know, by the by the forearm work. But uh, at this point, I mean, I think it's still a. Uh, something that needs a CT scan. We need to see, as Rick said, you know, is, is there anything left of this on the humeral joint at this point? You know, he's, he, his arthritis may be a lot worse now and uh, really trying to salvage this elbow is going to be, I think, extremely challenging. <coughs> um, uh, but I would next step CT scan and, uh, and then like Rick says, get that software. It's free. And manipulate it and see see where you're really at. And I'm, you know, if you want to send Rick and I the images, we're happy to take a look offline and give you our thoughts. But I'm not sure that we'll be able to fix this problem, to be honest with you, at this point. It may not be fixable with standard techniques. Yeah, absolutely. So uh just to just to close up the case, they at this point. Uh, they decided to do a reconstruction of butt size of the medial and lateral ligaments. And, and a radial head resection, and that a procedure also failed. And this is the situation of the patient right now. Uh, he has a decent movement. This is the latest x-rays. Those anchors that you see are from the latest procedure uh, with the reconstruction that didn't work either. And, and in this one, we can see that there is this weird image that I hadn't seen before of the trochlea, uh, sorry, of the ulna articulating with like almost the medial epicondyle. And uh, uh, 
And the, the patient right now has a decent movement. Uh, and, and what do you think it's okay to leave this patient like this? Do you think that is there a, a procedure that may help this patient to, to improve this situation? Or maybe it's better to stop and leave this elbow like it is. This is the motion that the patient has with that articulation, which is amazing. Uh, does he have, how much pain does he have now? Uh, not much. Well, yeah, great job. I mean, I think the last <laughs> thing, quite frankly, I would have done would be take out his radial head. That would be my only comment, being the fact that it's my favorite bone and I don't like throwing it out. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, again, if it if it worked for him, that's great. I mean, you know, yes, his elbow is essentially, a, it's dislocated and it's functioning kind of okay. It's amazing. I presume his ulnar nerve must have got moved because uh, otherwise he would be having some trouble with it. And uh, so I wouldn't touch him personally because I don't think I could make this better. You know, obviously he's too young and too active to have an elbow replacement, but he can have that when he's older. I wouldn't do a fusion based on, you know, the fact he's not too painful and he's got some reasonable motion. Rick? I totally agree. I mean, it'd be hard to make him any better. Uh, a fusion, he'll be less happy. A total elbow is going to be, you know, at this point, and even later, it'll be difficult because of the, of the chronic deformity. There'll be a chronic pull on that that'll be really need to be mitigated. Um, the only other comment I'd make about the, the radial head that Graham said, I also would not have taken it out. But if I would have taken it out, uh, I would have assessed that medial coronoid because if the medial coronoid was out, and there's a question up here about, you know, considering coronoid reconstruction. The, the, the radial head makes for an, a good uh, a medial and anterior, potentially anterior coronoid graft as well. So um, I'm not suggesting that would have been a good operation. But before uh, a, a radial head is thrown out, if there's a coronoid injury, that's a good graft to use. So just a comment on that. But again, for this patient in particular, I, I wouldn't have taken the radial head out. Uh, and, and at this point, I would leave him alone. Yeah. Great. I think one last question is sometimes it, it is often in Colombia to see patients that have sequela of injuries like this and they are young and active. Uh, what is your opinion for interpositional arthroplasty? What is your indication? Do you use that technique still or do you, you don't use interpositional arthroplasty anymore? Go ahead, Graham. Well... You know, I know that my mentor has had some reasonable results with it, and I would say reasonable, and they're not great. I've had, I would say, generally poor results with interposition arthroplasty, except in inflammatory arthritis, surprisingly. So I get, I've had some decent results in juvenile rheumatoid patients. Uh, they're quite happy with a bit of motion and, and, uh, and less articular pain. But in my trauma patients like this, I mean, he's you know, he's already so unstable that doing an interposition arthroplasty won't matter at all because he's still not going to stay in joint. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any role for that here. There may be some isolated indications for interpositions, maybe patients after radial head excision, you know, uh, Sean's new pillow arthroplasty, that might make some sense. But I, I, I don't think that in general, the interposition arthroplasties that we have, have been talked about a lot, have a great role in my personal practice, but Rick may have a different opinion. No, I, I've used them infrequently and I've not gotten them to work. Uh, if you go back to slide 33, Joe, uh, if you can, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. But that's a 3D reconstruction of their members. Is there a slide 33 on your top? Uh, talk? Give me a sec. Do you, you want sure? slide this one? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So, so there we can see. Uh, ah, this, this video doesn't work, but I have the video that's okay. right here. But, but you can see, you it, can see that it's ulna. right here. Yeah, give me a that second. Ulna is, and, and, is there. You go. Look, right. So that's what I would have liked to have seen earlier. That exact view, but but we can see that that's completely statically unstable. It's not anywhere near the right spot. I and mean, if you break down the, the biggest paper that Dr. Mori published on his his uh, interpositions. The ones that did well were the ones that were stable to start with. So Graham said that just now. So this is not stable, and this will not do well, even in Maury's hands, and you know, according to his paper. So I don't think interpositions are uh, uh, something to do in this patient.
again, he's doing too well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we are going to close up. Is there, a, there we don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very much, guys, again, for your time and for sharing your thoughts and knowledge with us. Uh, we'll be happy to have you here in person at some point. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much to the participants as well. And again, I want to invite you all to our meeting in Cartagena in October. We have the shoulder meeting this year and we will have the elbow one next year. And I will be happy to have you guys here in person next time. That's wonderful. Please well, uh, let me know when it is. That's an elbow meeting. That's exciting. Just an elbow. <laughs> That's what I yeah. call meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well done. Great to see you guys. And thanks for sharing yes. that case. I think we all learned a little bit from it. So. Yeah, great to see you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Adios.